Bulubanakana, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this announcement uh, this afternoon is to review our COVID response and make some important changes to our strategy. But before we get into those details, we wish to speak briefly on the serious flooding brought by heavy rains in the West. A total of five schools, as, uh, as we speak, have opened as evacuation centers, three schools in Ba, one in Latoka, and one in Nandi. Heavy rain is expected to continue till midweek, and flash and riverine flooding will be an issue in the coming days for the Western Division and some places in Vanuolevu. This, unfortunately, has had some unexpected implications for the primary school students in the West, who we know have been looking forward to returning to their classrooms and seeing their friends and teachers. Due to the flooding, all primary and secondary schools in the West will be closed for the next week. We know that's disappointing, for, uh, disappointing news for students who have all been preparing for their return to the classroom, but the weather has taken, unfortunately, a very poor turn, and it's safest we wait until next week until the rains clear up. The central and eastern and northern divisions are not impacted by this decision, which means that all schools in these divisions will be open as scheduled and will be welcoming back teachers and students. But if the, rain, the, the rains do pick up in any of these areas, we will have no choice but to close the schools. And in the interest of fairness, we are pausing year 13 exams and deferring the remaining exams until next week nationwide. Year 12 exams all over Fiji are deferred to next week as well. The Minister of Education is here with us and she'll be giving us further details in that respect. And indeed, you can ask any questions of her. Now, let's review where we stand on our recovery from COVID-19 pandemic. Since the day the pandemic arrived in Fiji, we have lived under some form of COVID-19 restrictions. Think back to that day, 19 March 2020, and everything that the world has endured since. The world has endured outbreaks of the virus, lockdowns, 5.7 million lives lost around the world, as well as global economic devastation. In Fiji alone, we lost over 100,000 livelihoods. This has become a once-in-a-century crisis by every measure, and we have confronted it through the greatest mobilization of resources, both human and financial, in Fijian history. $500 million in assistance was paid directly by the government to Fijians whose unemployment is affected, and of course, indirectly on their behalf. Over 66,000 food ration packs were delivered to families who were isolating in their homes. 1.3 million doses and counting of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered. Today, and thanks to policies like No Jab, No Job, over 90% of Fijians over the age of 15 are fully vaccinated. We did all of this, averting a socioeconomic catastrophe and readying ourselves for a recovery. While managing the devastation of adverse weather, including storms and floods and four cyclones, Harold, Yasa, Anna and Cody. And we can see some of the bad storms we are during at the moment. We were guided by a strategic vision to free our country from the grip of the pandemic. That, that strategy demanded decisive leadership from government and it demanded discipline, compassion and solidarity from every Fijian. Together we saved lives, thousands of them, while government worked diligently behind the scenes with our friends from Australia, India, New Zealand and the USA to secure COVID-19 vaccines. Then we restored jobs, thousands of them, by becoming one of the world's most vaccinated societies, earning back our freedoms and reopening our borders to the world. We were guided every day by our Honourable Prime Minister's direction, who reminded us that, and I quote, our journey to the new normal is a marathon, not a sprint. We have to move forward in step with the science at a careful and responsible pace, unquote. And we did so by instituting measures that were proportional to the threat the virus posed, easing them when appropriate and strengthening them when necessary, including when the Omicron variant arrived at our shores. While Omicron produced a less severe disease than past variants, its highly contagious nature posed a threat to the capacity of our healthcare system. We upped our enforcement of COVID safe measures in response while we continue to deploy, deploy 
booster doses to enhance our community immunity. Unlike many more advanced countries, our ICU capacity was never overwhelmed by the third wave of cases thanks to our high vaccination coverage and our stepped-up enforcement of COVID-safe measures. And we avoided a crisis in the delivery of outpatient care by quickly opening up private GP clinics to members of the public with the costs covered 100% by the Fijian government. And we plan to open more private GP clinics to the public. Ladies and gentlemen, the science says today that the worst of the Omicron variant or wave is behind us. Hospitalizations are falling and the number of boosted Fijians is rising every day. It's time for a new direction, one that is guided by the same principles our Honorable Prime Minister set out, one that considers the lessons we've learned and one that recognizes that while the pandemic is not over, it has entered a totally new phase. What this means in practice is that we no longer need to look at the world solely through the lens of COVID-19. We are moving to a stage where we can remove our blinders and treat COVID as an endemic disease instead of a pandemic, not unlike the common flu. COVID cases aren't going away, but our focus from a health and policy standpoint will be on particularly vulnerable groups, while the rest of our society more or less live normally as we rebuild our economy and focus on addressing the other challenges affecting the lives of ordinary people. For example, non-communicable diseases. For the past several weeks, we have been carefully reviewing the Omicron variant's impact on our healthcare system, consulting our experts and crafting a new phase for our response that takes the nation forward at the responsible pace that our Honorable Prime Minister asked of us. We have far more certainty than we did two years ago or even one year ago. Still, it is important to mention that there are a number of variables we'll continue to monitor over the coming months. But we promised the Fijian people that we will only have restrictions if they are truly necessary and we'll lift them as soon as we can. That is what is happening today. From Monday, 7th of February, which is from midnight tonight, the curfew will be lifted. Not moved, not shifted, lifted completely. The curfew was impl implemented to prevent non-essential gatherings that can spread the virus and allow for reliable contact tracing at certain hours in the evening. In some ways, it served as a national barometer of progress towards normalcy as we moved the start time from 6 p.m. hour by hour to midnight in recognition of reaching our vaccination targets. Now it's removed entirely. We recognize that the curfew had other benefits unrelated to the virus itself. We've spoken with many households in particular who have told us that they were very grateful to have their children and loved ones at home more often because of the curfew. These are benefits that came unexpectedly and hopefully most people will continue to spend more time with their loved ones at home and take care of their community. Of course, we cannot justify the continuation of a curfew for the sake of just these benefits. But we want to highlight them nonetheless. Because if you are someone who found they spent more quality time at home, became more productive, or studied more, you can make the choice to keep those good habits. The pandemic has taught us all some hard lessons, and the more insights we take out of it, the better. Lessons from the hard times, but also the good times we've had with our families and loved ones. The curfew also meant less movement and therefore fewer opportunities for criminals. We've taken this matter very seriously and we've been in discussions with the Fiji police force for weeks to review their capacity and strategy to contain criminal activity. With the curfew lifted, our police are adopting a new posture to uphold public safety, putting more boots on the ground in communities and high traffic areas to crack down on criminality. The Commissioner of Police, who is here with us, will el elaborate further on their strategy. Even though the curfew is removed, nightclubs will not be allowed to operate. However, taverns, many of which used to be licensed as nightclubs, may op open until 1 a.m. at 80% capacity throughout Fiji, provided that sitting is properly spaced out, dancing is not allowed, and all areas are well ventilated. 
As for our other health measures, the following changes take effect from tomorrow also. Public service vehicles can operate at full capacity, which include, of course, buses, minibuses, carriers and taxis. However, we will continue to enforce mask wearing on board all public vehicles. Indoor and outdoor sporting events, including competitive sports, may be held with spectators at 80% capacity, provided those spectators wear masks. Businesses, venues and places of worship and houses of worship may open at full capacity, with the exception of high-risk businesses which must operate at 80% capacity. High-risk businesses include cinemas, bars, taverns, gyms, hairdressing, hairdressing and salon services, tattoo parlors and gaming venues. The Care Fiji app and QR will not be required for entry into businesses and venues anymore because we are not presently relying on contact tracing as part of our COVID-19 response. The Care Fiji app may be required again in the future if the epidemiological situation changes. So please keep the app on your phone so it is easily available if needed again. The Vax Check tool is also no longer required for use by businesses given that Fiji is a highly vaccinated society. However, the high risk businesses that we've just listed out and all Care Fiji certified businesses will be required to check the vaccination cards of their patrons and customers. It is the responsibility of businesses to enforce COVID safe behavior on the premises. The fines for violations remain in effect. There is no more restriction on informal gatherings, including gatherings at home, effective immediately. We've also developed clear guidelines on where masks are required to be worn. The full guidance on mask wearing will be published online. Australia recently made a change to its testing requirements for their citizens returning from international travel by accepting rapid antigen tests, or RATS as they're called, as an alternative to PCR tests. We're adding that same option. Travelers 12 years and above entering Fiji from a travel partner country may produce a negative rapid antigen test taken within 24 hours of the flight's scheduled departure. In other words, the more expensive PCR tests are no longer required to board flights to Fiji. Details of acceptable test kits are published online. The Ministry of Health and Medical Services will continue to monitor the global epidemiological situation and may introduce or reintroduce more stringent risk reduction measures if required. And of course, the Permanent Secretary for Health and Medical Services is here with us to answer any questions in that respect. We're also reviewing the requirement of a three-day Care Fiji certified accommodation requirement for arrivals into Fiji in favor of an entry system that allows passengers to submit confirmation of booked COVID-19 tests in Fiji within 48 hours of landing in Fiji. Before we make the change, however, we need more testing sites open in Fiji. We've put out an expression of interest for the private sector and we encourage more people to apply so, they, so that we can open as many testing sites as possible. We'll have more details to announce on that policy shift very soon. All Care Fiji certified hotels, transport operators and businesses must welcome this flexibility with stronger adherence to the measures that are required to maintain the certifications. If you fail to meet the high bar of COVID safety, uh, COVID safety measures we put in place and for our visitors, our COVID safe ambassadors and police will shut you down. We cannot tolerate one bad apple in our tourism sector, spoiling the buns for all those who are following the rules. These easing of the restrictions, ladies and gentlemen, mean a great deal for our economy and for the restoration of livelihoods. With the ease of restrictions locally and testing requirements made easier and more affordable, we'll create, a more, local, we'll create more local economic activity and attract more tourists. That means more businesses, including for micro and small businesses, more demand and more jobs for our people. And we will further consolidate our path towards record-breaking economic growth. We, of course, would like to thank you all for your compliance, getting vaccinated, and acting in a true patriotic spirit, helping those in need as a community. With this effort from all of us, we are able to lift more restrictions and welcome back a sense of normality to our lives. But. There are some people 
a tiny minority who are not yet vaccinated or fully vaccinated. We urge them to get vaccinated. We are only able to roll back these measures because of the high rate of vaccination we have achieved. But there's more we want to be able to do, including getting our cinemas, our hair salons, gyms, tattoo parlors, and all the other businesses currently operating under capacity restrictions to fully reopen and get back more jobs for Fijians. So to those who are not fully vaccinated, our message is to please, please get it done. And those who are eligible for boosters, please get boosted. Getting vaccinated and getting boosted is the best way we can protect the progress we are announcing today and ensure that none of these health protection measures need to come back into force. Let's also please use these new freedoms responsibly and continue with the common sense measures like mask wearing, physical distancing, and good hand washing and sanitizing that can keep us safe. Ladies and gentlemen, let us close by wishing our friends in New Zealand a happy Waitangi Day. This week, 244 tons of aid donated by Fijians, NGOs, faith-based groups, and our Tongan community in Fiji arrived on Tongan shores aboard a Fijian vessel funded by the New Zealand government. That shared act of Pacific solidarity speaks volumes of the shared values of our people. Needless to say, we're all looking forward to 14 March when we can safely welcome back visitors from New Zealand to Fiji. That's the statement in respect of the matter at hand today. As I mentioned, uh, we are here uh, this afternoon with the Minister of Education, Heritage and Arts, the Commissioner of Police and the Permanent Secretary of Health and Medical Services. I'll now uh, get, uh, and I'll ask, sorry, the Minister of Education, Heritage and Arts, to make a few comments on the schools. And then, of course, we'll have the Permanent Secretary for Health and the Commissioner of Police who will elaborate further on the announcements that I've made. And then, of course, we'll open up the floor for any questions you may have. Thank you. Minister, please. Bulavinaka, and a very good afternoon to you all. As announced by the Acting Prime Minister, national examinations for years 12 and 13 uh, have been deferred by one week. Year 13 national examinations started on 1st February. Students will now sit for the remaining papers from 14th February. The order of papers will remain the same as it appears uh, in the examination timetable. Year 13 students have already set for English, biology, history, home economics, accounting, geography, and technical drawing papers. When examination starts on the 14th February, year 13 students will sit for the remaining papers as follows. Monday 14th February, mathematics. Tuesday 15th February, economics and applied technology. Wednesday 16th February, Vosavakaviti, Hindi, Urdu, Rotuman, and physics. Thursday 17th February, agricultural science and office technology. Friday 18th February, chemistry and computer studies. For year 12, examination will now commence on the 14th February instead of 7th February. And the order of papers will remain as in the original timetable. The schools not affected by the flood will resume face-to-face -face classes for ECE to year 11 from tomorrow, 7th February 2022. Years 12 and 13 students will be on study break to prepare for the exams. For the Western Division, all students from ECE to year 13 are asked to remain at home. Students from the Western Division will now return to school on 14th February 2022. Teachers in the Western Division who are not affected, and I repeat, not affected, by the flood should report to the school from tomorrow, 7th February 2022. Based on the latest weather forecast, heavy rain is expected to continue causing flood in the Western and some parts of the Northern Division. If accessibility to schools are affected due to floods, landslides or broken bridges or riverine flooding anywhere outside the Western Division, then these schools will be closed as well. Finally, I would like to uh, simply say that uh, during this adverse weather condition, uh, we must ensure that we keep our children away from flooded areas and I urge 
parents to supervise their children at all times. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Minister Kumar. Um, just in terms of uh, collaborations between the ministry and uh, universities, um, what, uh, what can you update us uh, in that area? Uh, we will try and produce our uh, results on time. Uh, we need those results for the universities. Uh, what we will do in this situation, we're going to increase the markers so that the work is done uh, very quickly. That's our plan. And once the marks are out, the results are out, we'll be able to submit that to the university. So at this stage, we don't see any delay in submitting the results to the universities. And uh, ma'am, for those students who might be seeking for a compassionate uh, pass, have you received any uh, ap application or interest in that area as well? I can give you the statistics uh, as of, uh, I mean, I can only give you the statistics for year 13 students who sat for the exam. Uh, there were about 97% uh, attendance uh, for that uh, examination. So uh, the 3% who did not sit for the exam, uh, once they make a submission uh, to the school or to the Ministry of uh, Education, then we will consider that. But as of now, we have not received anything. Bulubinaka, this uh, as has been highlighted in many of our discussions and statements over the last few days, we continue and persist to see a reduction in the uh, COVID-related admissions. And even with the patients who are coming into the hospitals, we are beginning to see that there is less and less space taken up by a COVID, uh, taken up by those who are testing positive for COVID-19. Uh, together with the other trends that we get from our other uh, indicators, especially in terms of uh, work retention, they do indicate that we have a persistent trend towards decreasing transmission. We also have, as highlighted, not seen much in terms of our ICU uh, care, being uh, uh, ICU care caseloads. We so given that we have supported a lot of the uh, public health, uh, uh, the alleviation of a lot of these public health restrictions, the only one that we do wish to continue is to maintain our masking uh, restrictions. That we ask that they remain in place for public spaces, and especially within a, uh, within public service vehicles. And uh, the only change will be that we will move it up to age eight years and upwards, class two and upwards. There will be a number of other exceptions that we will be posting out. And we do hope that uh, when we post out our exceptions, people will accept, uh, will interpret these exceptions in a positive manner and understand that the gist of what we're trying to do is to encourage you to keep wearing a mask whenever it is appropriate. We also will continue with your personal COVID-19 habits as regards to physical distancing and avoiding crowds. Um, those are important changes that require us to adapt to in order to be able to continue to uh, seek our socio-economic recovery uh, plan. I uh, hope that uh, we will all uh, keep uh, ourselves COVID safe during this uh, recovery plan and that we will maintain our commitment towards ensuring that uh, those who are vulnerable amongst us remain protected. Thank you. Sorry, is there any questions for the Minister of Health? So I know that it was um, highlighted that uh, there will be no um, nightclubs and uh, no dancing will, will, will be allowed by the new uh, protocols that just been announced. Uh, so, and uh, buses, it will be in full capacity. What is the difference? Can you just uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, um, most of our buses uh, do have uh, uh, fairly, the windows are open, it's open air, there's a lot of ventilation, I can assure ventilation. With our nightclubs, there's not so much ventilation. Um, 
some of our measures with regards that we maintain, like the mask and the nightclubs, these are just recognizing the fact that the virus is not gone. It's still around, and there are some people who are more vulnerable to the virus than others. It's in recognition of those facts. We, uh, we understand that for some people it's, uh, it's a big discomfort. However, unfortunately, I mean, we do live in a world where we have to adapt to a virus that can cause deaths. And uh, I've demonstrated over and over again in all my statements the number of deaths that we have seen. And I keep uh, mentioned, as I mentioned yesterday or the day before, those deaths are tragic. But the biggest tragedy is if we don't learn anything from them. So this is why we want to keep some of the restrictions that we have. So just for clarification, is dancing allowed at private functions, like birthday parties or weddings? Yes. Uh, let me just say that nightclub itself is a very contained space. You know, there's hardly any windows. Otherwise, it's like you don't get the ambience of a nightclub. I can see in many of our parties, we can have it outdoors, where you are a lot of, you know, you can look at it uh, from that angle. Eh? Um, at the end of the day, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of balance that has to be taken with all the COVID safe measures. Um, we can, if you improve ventilation, you can reduce on other things. Contact, close contact can be closer. That's how we're supposed to get to be able to live with the virus, so that we're able to balance the big three, uh, ventilation, masking, and distance. If we all start to learn the principles of that and we start doing it automatically, we would be, uh, you know, we'd be further along the way and we probably will mu need much less mandating of uh, all those measures. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Dr. Fong. So a couple of weeks ago, we um, asked you about a concern ra raised by the Fiji Nursing Association of the resignation of nurses. Um, from then until now, have you received uh, more resignation? And uh, if so, uh, Dr. Fong, uh, is it something that uh, are the vacant that that creates in the uh, Ministry of Health? Is it something that you're concerned about? Yes, I was going to leave that for my minister to deal with in his parliamentary speech, but I can just tell you quite frankly that there has been no increase in the resignations. What we have seen is a lot more people leaving because they did not get vaccinated, yes. But there's no difference between before COVID and after COVID. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As uh, said by uh, the Honorable Acting Prime Minister, I'd just uh, like to reassure the public again uh, of police operations going in now that the curfew is lifted, that some might be finding it a bit uneasy. There was four hours left of the curfew that we were dealing with. Uh, and if you were moving around, those of you who are authorized to move around uh, during curfew hours due to work, you would have noticed a change in the, the last 48 hours at least, that the checkpoints were lifted uh, and we relied more on mobility uh, and snap checkpoints and some static positions to be able to monitor movement uh, and deal with those that were breaking uh, the law uh, during the last 48 hours. In regards to crime stats, uh, for the last five years, uh, we've released annual reports that uh, in the last five years that has details of that and that has been uh, also forwarded to Parliament as well, that shows a clear decreasing trend, uh, overall crime trend decrease, and in some areas that might have increased, other areas uh, have decreased significantly. This year, with, uh, with the restrictions that were in place, the, the crime has really decreased, and the challenge for, for the Fiji Police Force now is to keep it there as things are, are, are lifted. So that is the, the challenge for us. So we have to continuously review uh, our posture on the ground and how we deal with issues uh, and reorientate ourselves and act decisively to be able to keep that crime rate as low as what we've experienced in the last 12 months. Despite what is being, uh, being said by some people, the crime trend overall has been decreasing. There may have been, may have been increase in, uh, in uh, our confiscation of drugs uh, in regards to marijuana and other drugs, 
that has increased, but in other areas it has decreased. Uh, an example, in the last uh, month we have had no road fatalities at all, and that is a, the record for the last three decades at least. So those are where the balance comes in and there's an overall decrease. In regards to dealing with uh, peri-urban and rural areas, we were more focused uh, and driven by stats and we postured ourselves in dealing with the more densely populated areas during cur curfew hours. We have changed that and we have reviewed our, our mobility capabilities as well in the disposition of our vehicles. Uh, as we were, there were some vehicles that were pulled in to be able to, to assist us uh, in the posture that we had adopted, now moving out again, and as we get new vehicle replacements in, uh, the incident in Baulevo, an isolated one, uh, but there are other issues there that we need to look at, uh, the right people in uh, such police posts to be able to deal with uh, the community makeup. Uh, we are moving a brand new vehicle that has been uh, handed over to us by Ministry of Economy, uh, out there tomorrow, which will be handed over by my deputy and the director of traffic, and they will also take the time to interact uh, with the uh, community policing committee and also members of the community there. We'll be also moving one of those new vehicles into Ravi Ravi in Mba, those police posts. So we're looking at those peri-urban and rural areas now where we have to, have to increase our footprint. Crime is such that when we adopt a, a posture, those people that are involved in those criminal activities also study us and adjust themselves. So it is an ongoing process where we have to continue to do that. And the beauty of things is that we're working with uh, acquiring new technology. The new vehicles that we're pushing out now uh, also has uh, a separate telephone number that has been programmed into the vehicle system. So uh, those four numbers, so if we push out one to Mbao Levo Police Post, uh, the vehicle will have the, the signage outside, Mbao Lebo Police Post, and we'll also disseminate those phone numbers for the phone number for the vehicle on the social media platforms, and we also push it out on the, uh, the print media as well. So that is another way, if you see the vehicle, if you're in the Bowley where you see the vehicle going past and need them to act quickly on something that's going on, you'll be able to call the vehicle directly rather than calling the police post, because the police post manning is very minimal, and sometimes the, pull the post officer himself is moving in the vehicle while he closes up the post. So you still can contact him now or her on that new system that's in the new vehicles that is being rolled out now by government. So that in a, in a nutshell is how we're going to do things. I cannot disseminate the, 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 the finer details of the posture we're going to adopt or what we're going to do for obvious reasons. But you will see changes happening. You'll see a lot, uh, a few movement of senior uh, staff uh, in regards to that more interaction now with members of the public, which we couldn't do effectively due to COVID restrictions. Now with the restrictions being rolled back uh, a bit, we should be able to interact more with members of the public now. Do you have any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Um, Excuse me. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Commissioner. So you mentioned that uh, the crime rate decreased over the past five years. If you can just clarify what factors that you noted contributed to, de to this decrease and if the reporting trend uh, stayed the same during the course of the decrease in crime trend. Uh, we worked with the uh, stats. We targeted uh, certain areas based on the stat that was being uh, put together by our, our stats unit. Uh, and that allowed us to be more targeted in areas. I will not be able to just tell you what it was, because every year was different, but the annual reports are there, and if you want them, I can pass them on to you for the last five years. Okay, just on the reporting trend, uh, was it the same all throughout that five years, or did it? No, there, there are some slight differences there, and I, I can't tell you off the cuff. I'll, I'll have to get you the reports to be able to, to give you all that information. Any more questions? Sir, can you confirm if uh, people like in uh, informal gatherings should still um, like practice wearing masks and uh, like physical distance when they're in close proximity? I think that was just clearly articulated by the Permanent Secretary and, um, and the Honorable uh, Acting Prime Minister. And we've heard it here today. We'll go and look at uh, that in more detail and we'll be able to, to get up. But 
that has been, I think that has been clearly stated, and I wouldn't want to say anything further to that. Uh, we'll be enforcing what has been said and what is going to be printed out uh, uh, press by the Gazette. So should people uh, mask up when they go for a run or walk? <coughs> I ask because uh, some people have been Okay, I'll, I'll get the relevant uh, person to answer the, the, the question uh, for you. I, I think the, the, about sports has been said by the Honorable Acting Prime Minister. I'll get the Acting Permanent Secretary for, for help to answer that for you. So I ask because some people have been stopped and warned by police officers because they were going for a walk and run. They still... Okay, yeah. uh, th that's another, another area where responsibility comes in. Eh? Some people we've seen and we've come close to them to warn them uh, to wear their mask obviously are not in training gear and they tell us they are training. So each situation is different. So I don't know who's been telling you that he's been training and he's been told to wear a mask. Obviously, different situation happens and some of them, obviously, you, you just have to drive by and you'll see who's going on a stroll in a town session with a cigarette in the mouth. Obviously, it's not a physical activity or training run. So those are the people that we have to deal with and every situation is different. It comes with a sense of responsibility, which is very important here. We, we don't want to be walking around holding the law book to your forehead or having the gun pointed at you and saying, this is what you do. It, it, it calls on responsibility on everyone and about honesty and, and integrity in, in following the rules. Thank you. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, um, questions from the public in terms of the no jab, no job policy, given that uh, uh, people who are vaccinated still get COVID and some who are fully vaccinated are still dying and the decrease in uh, um, uh, community transmission of the virus. Is this something that uh, um, uh, you'll be cons uh, reconsidering the no jab, no jab, uh, pol no job, no jab, sorry, no jab, no job policy. So I, I don't understand your question. What is your question? Um, uh, Mr. Will, we, sorry? will you reconsider um, removing that uh, no jab, no job policy given that people who were fully vaccinated uh, continue to uh, get the virus and transmit it and some who are fully vaccinated are also even dying? Yeah, but it's not a question of transmission. The fact of the matter is that because of the fact that we have such a high uh, rate of vaccination, we are able to do what we are doing today. People, of course, I mean, as Dr. Fong has highlighted on numerous occasions for the past 18 months or so, that getting uh, vaccinated does not necessarily mean you won't necessarily not get the vaccine, uh, the, the virus. But you won't die from it. Some people, of course, have died because they had some underlying conditions. So you cannot ask sort of that kind of sort of blanket question, nor can you extrapolate and say, well, these people actually got vaccinated, and because they got sick, therefore, let's not have a no jab, no job policy. The reality of the matter is that because, we got of that because of that policy, we have a high rate of vaccination, and because of that, many Fijians actually have not died or got very severely sick. And because of that, we're able to open the schools, we're able to open the economy. So that logically, it doesn't make sense what you're proposing. Any other questions? Uh, so I have one question. As the Minister for Elections, um, we had um, a concerned citizen contact us and said that uh, she visited one of the FU office and wasn't allowed. I know you'd highlighted that uh, government has relaxed VAC check. So uh, she said that uh, she entered one of the FU offices and was told that uh, she couldn't enter mm -hmm. and, uh, and she couldn't change her card and she couldn't if she was not vaccinated, she wasn't vaccinated. If she was not vaccinated, she was not going to be allowed to vote. Mm. Can you just confirm as the Minister of Elections there is a no vote, no, uh, no jab, no vote policy? Uh, there's no such law in place. Uh, and you need to obviously talk to the Ministry of the, sorry, Fijian Elections Office about this. I mean, you, don't, you know better than that, not to direct those kind of operational matters to the Minister responsible for Elections. We don't run the Elections Office. We've said this on so many occasions. You know that. We essentially deal with the financing of it and we deal with essentially any laws to do with the elections. But we have an independent body called the Electoral Commission. We have an independent office called the Fijian Elections Office and it's provided for under the law also in the budget, the independent body. It's like you come in and ask me what is the Auditor General going to do or what is FICA going to do. They're independent bodies. We don't run the operations. So go and talk to them. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, no further questions. Naka, thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.